I dug out the old coverage from AW this morning. <laughs> Seven, 17 years ago. Wow. 17 years ago. Does it, uh, does it, does it feel that? That long ago, Jason, being the being the lead off man, you might want to might want to kick off by saying a few things. I think when you just put it in like perspective, those days it is a long time ago. But when we're together and we catch up, it just takes you back to that moment in time, and uh, you know, those memories are really fresh and vivid for us. We spent a lot of time um, in recent months um, working to produce our book, so we were just sharing memories the whole build-up actually of you know i'm um, from juniors right through to um to that great night in athens yep our race and uh what was quite fascinating and um interesting for me personally was obviously i've got my own kind of um memories through my you know what i saw you know heard or smelt and um but then hearing it from the other perspectives of um yeah from darren marlon and mark it was just it was just fantastic um you know i, I hand over to the others to to also um, give comment on this. Yeah, I think, um, as Jason said, I think uh, to think it was 17 years ago, it's one of those moments in your life that you'll never forget. And I think um, for all of us from a very young age, we dreamt about going to the Olympic Games, potentially standing on the top of that podium. And for it to happen in 2004 was absolutely unbelievable. I think what what made it even more special is that it happened with these three guys. Um, I think for me, it just created this bond and this friendship that just can't be broken. Um, and it brought us so close. Um, so, yeah, it's it's 17 years, but yeah, it's 17 years of having this tight relationship and this bond that is everlasting. You guys were written off, weren't you, beforehand? You, you were, I don't think people gave you much chance. No, not at all. It was uh, quite depressing, to be fair, because, you know, <laughs> teams of um, the, the past have, you know, not achieved the ultimate goal, which was the Olympic gold medal. But with the progression that all four of us was doing in our careers at the time, it was very likely it was possible to happen. And the support to us just didn't feel there in the media, you know, um, section. But um, as a team, we knew we was going to go out there and, and do the unthinkable. You know, I think that's what makes it so powerful because we believed in ourselves to go out there and achieve the goals. We knew America was always going to be a threat, but um, we knew our batting skills were 10 out of 10 and we could go out there and be put under pressure, but we knew where we needed to be at this, any point in time. So, yeah, yeah, um, we were the underdogs. but They had such a strong team as well. I mean, it's not as if you beat some B team or something. I mean, they, they had a remarkably strong team. I mean that, that must have made it all the sweeter to have beaten the team that was full of full of such big names. Yeah, you cast your mind back and you think, what well, on first leg you had the almighty Sean Crawford who just medalled uh, to stand on the track, know that he's the fastest man in the world over two hundred meters, one of the fastest in the hundred meters. You got uh, Justin Gatlin also uh, days before got a gold medal. It's come to also he stands on that leg, knowing he's the fastest man in the world. You got Kobe Miller, who was uh, on the rankings, was six on the rankings, and anyone above him wasn't in the race other than the Americans. And then you got the Almighty again. Uh, uh, what's his name? Remind me. Maurice. Maurice. Maurice Green. <laughs> Maurice Green. <laughs> Maurice, Maurice Green. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So the four fastest men on the planet in that race, and then we looked at our times and our progresses, and you saw our journeys. You wouldn't have thought that. Uh, we'll be in a position to win. But uh, yeah, as, as the boys have said, it was a special moment. Uh, we bonded together. Uh, we were completely focused on the job at hand. Uh, didn't take anything personal. It was all about getting the baton around as quickly and as sharply as possible. And you saw that in our changeovers. Yeah, 17 years ago. <laughs> Long time, right? But hey, it still feels fresh. There's bits in the book about, uh, about Mark on the anchor leg being really nervous. You were still pretty young at the time. I mean, that must have been terrifying, really, to go up against Maurice Green on the on the final leg. It must have been been really, really unnerving and quite difficult for well, for all, all the guys in particular, but also looking after Mark when he had such responsibility on that final leg. Oh, most definitely. But I think where we were, we were confident in our craft, you know. So even though I was nervous, it was good nerves, you know. It wasn't nerves that I could have walked away and not raced. It was 
nerves um, of not knowing what what the outcome may be. You know, um, and in the warm up room, these guys definitely um, kept me and kept me up spirited, and um, they believed in me because it's a big task. You know, bringing that baton home. You know, um, after the work's been done in the first three legs, and to get it on my leg and to fail at that point would be a disaster. So um, they made sure that I was in good spirit. I knew where I needed to be, footsteps and all the rest of it, the logistics. And um, we executed on the day. We had a great coach as well in Steve Perks. You know, um, he definitely made us believe in ourselves. You know, um, if it wasn't for that final warm-up, which I think went amazing, you know, on the warm-up track, that 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 final practice, for me, I think that's where the belief came. Uh, we could go out there and we could upset the apple cart, you know what I mean? And we, and we did. Yeah, and I think, it, I think it was important, especially with Mark being the youngest, just that you gave him all the variables of what can, can happen. And um, I think because of the belief that we had in ourselves, one of the key things was saying to Mark that we're going to give you a lead. So don't be surprised by that, you know, because <laughs> that, that could be the scariest bit. All of a sudden you got this baton in the lead and then suddenly with 50 metres to go, you realise where you are. You're at the Olympic Games you lead in the four by 100 meter race. And then you start thinking about Maurice Green chasing you down. And I think because we all had so much faith in what we were going to be capable of, just saying to Mark, look, we are going to give you a lead. Don't let that surprise you and just do what you do. We had the utmost faith in what Mark was capable of. And I think that's testament to him as a sprinter, as a young sprinter. We had that belief that if we gave him a lead, he would hold on. And that's what he did. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Great. Sorry. Um, yeah, so I also agree uh, to reinforce what the boys have been saying. With Mark, I've known Mark a long time, as we all have, and his mindset for last leg, there's a certain mindset that's necessary and important to have. And uh, granted, Mark being young, we all knew, the three of us knew that he was the right person for that job. So when he stood there against, yes, the fastest men in the world, uh, not having the best of, uh, again, journey as, as, as anticipated and expected, went out there and did the job. So, yeah, it's, it's just that complete belief in each other. It's something that um, is built from a long time. Uh, you look at the book, the book talks about our, our, our backgrounds and our stories and the, you can see why it tied together and why we're so such, a, such an amazing team. Yeah, I'd just like to add um, that the beauty of that evening, it just goes to show, I mean, you know, when we look at some of our athletes going into major championships and you compare against, you know, stronger rivals, you, know, you just got to have that hope and belief and just deliver your absolute maximum because that's all we could do is focus on our performance. I mean, when you look against the Americans, I mean, to tell Mark we're going to give him the bat in, um, in the league, we're supposed to be down on my leg by the time um, <laughs> Sean Crawford's got around his, um, yeah, the bend, two metres down. And it was about two metres per person, like when you look man for man. So, you know, we we're going to be... You know, nearly 10 meters, um, you know, behind the USA if it went to the, you know, the, the form books. So, um, and I think when I look back, Darren was just, you know, done a great job with with Mark particularly by just, you know, really building him up, making him feel comfortable, and actually, and you know, um, empowering him that he could do something no other um, anchor person has done for Britain for a, a very long time in the Olympic Games. And that was, we're going to give you the baton in the lead and you're going to hold off the great Morris. <laughs> you know, and, and that's what you need. You need, you just need that positive attitude and having somebody like Darren with his experience of performing at those major championships, you know, Mark believed that we, we all believed in that evening that it was going to be our night. We knew we were better planned than anybody else. And usually with relays, I guess the guys can answer a bit more about this as well. Sometimes when you come off a disappointment of uh, individuals, sometimes your energy can be quite low. And for us, all four of us, not one of us made it to a final individual event. So we were all pretty beat up by the media. And uh, But we just, um, we use that power, um, us against them, um, to turn it around. And it was, uh, yeah, formidable. I think, point, I yeah, think... Point to prove. Yeah, I think that was the key. I think it's how do you channel uh, the disappointment? Um, you know, yes, for me, the, the media were, were entitled to say what they said because we had underperformed. There's no yeah. denying that. You can't turn around and say, 
getting knocked out in the semi-final in 100 or 200 metres was good enough. Uh, we were more talented than that. So mm. I think we had to deal with that disappointment internally as well. Um, obviously, yeah, you never want anybody writing anything bad about you, but sometimes that's just life. It's part of the story. It's part of the journey. So the key thing was just picking ourselves back up and having this utmost belief in, in what we practised. I think a lot of people from the outside looking in just think that we not fluked it, but we were lucky to win Olympic gold. But I think it'd been a journey that we'd been on for eight, many, many maybe years. eight years, yeah, eight years, many. you know. Um, yeah, could could and, one of you guys talk about that? Because I know I know it, it, it went back to kind of 1992 or so, didn't it? I mean, it, your kind of relay background, it kind of went through with with Steve Perks was involved, who Mark mentioned a moment ago. I mean, there was quite it was it was a victory that was quite some years in the making. Yeah, well, for me personally, you know, I was a young athlete, so I was in and out of the senior relay setup for many, many years. And, you know, if you've read the book, you'll know I experienced many disappointments. You know, so from my perspective, you know, uh, being a part of the senior relay team was one of the hardest things to achieve in track and field for me. You know, um, so my first experience was Edmonton. Um, and I know there was a lot of politics going on in the background regarding who's the right fit for the right position and who can achieve the ultimate goal. And for me, I kind of seen the story unfold. You know, we got to, well, before that 2000, where I decided not to go to Sydney. You know, that was my first taste of being a part of the senior team. So um, for me, it was always, I was, I was going to get there, but I didn't know when I was going to get there because there were so many hurdles and, sprinters that were considered better relay runners than me ahead of me at that time but like I said all the cards fell into place and it happened for me in 2003 2004 so 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 for me it's a different kind of story to the rest of the guys if that makes any sense yeah I'd like to just um, add so Marlon and myself started racing at 15 years of Asian Open meetings in Telford is like my earliest memory then we went through um, a junior program together and that was with um, Steve Perks um, being you know coming into the the relay program so that's where our relationship started I joined Darren probably 1996 um, Atlanta Olympic squad um, training camp so that's where I got to start to know Darren and remember I again Darren's older than me I looked up to Darren because he was you know, he was a double um, you know, uh, world junior was a silver medal winner wouldn't you Darren um, so it was like and a much faster athlete so um that's why we started working together but we went through the heartache of uh expecting success to come really easy at the sydney olympic games because we were good we won europeans commonwealths um, we ran americans close at the world championships 1999 but we um as we went to that critical year i i think it's fair to say we weren't a team uh, in the end there was too much infighting uh we we lost the focus to do the things that we should be doing really well and easy. And uh, we came away what we deserved, which was nothing. So we had to eat some serious humble pie and rebuild. Yeah. And I think when you, when you look back, a lot of that happened in 2000 because of the success in 97. So we won the bronze in, at the world championships in 97. Obviously then 99, we break the European four by 100 meter relay record um, in claiming the silver medal just behind the Americans. So straight away then you go from a team that it doesn't look like they're going to achieve things to all of a sudden they've gone to two world championships and brought back two medals. So as you go into the Olympics in 2000, you've almost guaranteed yourself a medal if you do the job that you've done in previous years. And I think the management needs to take some kind of blame and responsibility because... They brought too many team members into the team. They brought too many athletes in. Only four could race. And was it 10 that they took to the yeah, Olympics? Squad of 10, yeah. Yeah, squad 10. Uh, I think just to add what Darren was saying there as well, uh, one of the big things, the big mistakes we made then in, in, in Sydney was yeah, taking the 10 and not having a fixed strike six and the other four should have been there as a reserve if anything happened to that six. And it's easier said that uh, this is Australia. Uh, it was a sensible thing to take more athletes out there, but um, 
obviously the jet lag and time zones and sprinting being such a nerve uh, response event. You can't go stepping on the track. So it was important to take athletes out there early. But at the same time, yeah, uh, it was a mistake to have, right, there you go, all 10, all fight for those six spots. And that's when it started getting really messy, which we definitely illustrate in the book. But um, you had uh, you had eight in um, in Athens, though, didn't you? So you kind of just kind of pruned the, the squad a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, I think we, I think by Athens, well, even before Athens, we learned the lesson from two thousand. Yeah, because we, as as Marlon said, we had so many athletes there, but there was no definition of well, this is the strike six or yeah. this is the strike four. So by the time mm. we get to Athens kind of people know who the strike six are yeah, and yeah. then are more aware of who the strike four can be. Obviously, if I, there, were, there were injuries and illnesses. Christian Malcolm missed out because of illness. So, Chris you know, yeah, Chris Lambert. So y- you needed to have um, that bigger core group of athletes, but it was just, the, as I say, just defining well, this is your course, this is your six, strike six, as long as there's no problems, mm. and this will be your strike four. And I think once we ironed out those problems from 2000, we were able to be stronger then in 2001, etc. And just And just to add on to that, I mean, we um, also with Athens, we put our, you know, our best team out for the semi-final which was quite un- unheard of because usually there might be some, Darren would often be doing the 200 metres, 100 and 200 metres. So may, you know, uh, have to recover during the earlier rounds and they come in for the final. But that was a really, really good decision because we were able to make, uh, you know, timings, uh, the precision of the baton exchanges based on real up-to-date data, like within 24 hours. So, um, and we were able to tweak it from going from the semi-final where we weren't quite, uh, as thin as um, we would have liked, but that caused us to resharpen ourselves, make those tweaks, and then we delivered the most perfect changeovers um, you know, in Olympic history. Yeah, and I think, Jason, sorry, just to add quickly, that still happens now in the relay teams. Yeah. So the success that you see the relay teams having, that model was taken forward. So whichever athletes run the semi-final, the likelihood is, unless there's an injury, they will run the final. Yeah. I was going to say your semi didn't go that well. What, what was said, <laughs> what was said after that with I mean, as you say, you ironed out the, was it, was it just all due to technical things or, or were there, were there a few harsh you know, words flying around? Or what? If, if you want to look at it technically, that was only the, the first time the team as four was ran together in a high pressured competition. So there was going to be rust in the, in the, in the pipe work somewhere. Yeah. Um, and for us to go away from that and adapt and adjust within what was it 24 hours I can't remember yeah. 24 hours and then to come out and hit the nail on the head and run it as perfect as possible you know um, for me this goes to show character you know um, and we all wanted the same thing we was all singing from the same hymn book you know um, we all had disappointments in our individuals you know I know we got hit hard by the media but our personals as well you know our coaches at home our families you know we was gutted as human beings not to make our dreams of making finals and achieve our ultimate goals so we had to walk away from Athens with something positive and I think that came into the basket yeah on the day you know um like I said in the book you know um there was an aura in the air there was a feeling amongst us that we knew we was going to go out there and do what we needed to do yeah Um, and I think uh, I think even though we messed up the heat, it didn't change the belief that we could win. I think, if anything, it just instilled it a lot more because we knew we'd made so many mistakes that we could yeah. correct those mistakes. And if we corrected those mistakes, yes, we could definitely be ahead of the Americans. Um, a lot of it was down to the changeovers and our strongest point, our strongest points in, in the race are our changeovers. So all we've got to do is put them together. If we put them together, <laughs> you know, something crazy will happen. So, yeah, we weren't too down. Um, there was a little bit, a little bit of disappointment, obviously, because you mm-hmm. want to perform better. But we weren't too down at all. We still had that same level of belief. Yeah, well, I, I, I can't agree more. So, um, what I found, from my perspective, was uh, going over the line and qualifying. 
uh, there was some dispute between myself and Mark's changeover, but I knew I got the baton in. So I look, literally looked down as I gave the baton on to Mark. I knew that I gave him the baton safely so they can look at the video as much as they want. So I was all good. It's all fine. <laughs> and then, and we, and without again going into too much of uh, the depth of the book, there's a part when we sit down and watch the video footage of the, and that was a key point for us because it, it was a shocking donkey performance in some respects in the semi-final <laughs> but we, we we still qualified comfortably so oh, if we iron these problems out we're going to rock the world yeah. and that was just for me that was key that was key yeah, yeah. The, the penny the penny dropped really for us i mean whenever you're part of the great britain northern ireland relay team you always got high hopes you're going to do well you you know we're used to winning medals maybe not in the olympics but we're used to winning medals and we always felt that we were good enough to win medals and even in Athens. But when we had the lane draw, we were in lane two and in Sydney, we were in lane one. So it's a tighter bend. So we knew we were going to have some challenges on the bend, but also we had, we had a really strong lineup. We had a USA in that race as well. And it was with those kind of shocking kind of cha changeovers uh, and watching the replay before we left the track, we just, the penny had dropped back hey, listen, if we can sharpen this up. We know what we can do here. We can turn this around. We can beat the USA. Remember, they beat us by probably nearly two metres. But that's where the belief totally went, you know, 360. To we, we, we're going to win this. And um, I remember when we um, left that track, because we had so much abuse by the, by the media at the time, we felt that the pencils were already being sharpened. They expect us to be DQ'd and stuff like that. So, um, and it would have been a you know, total disaster for for the um, athletics team and particularly for the men's by not winning any gold medals. Um, and I remember we sheltered, Darren and myself sh um, sheltered Mark. So we fronted up with the media through mix zones, stuff like that, um, to protect Mark because he'd had such a terrible bashing and we fronted it. And again, we what we wanted to do was to be positive because we knew they just want to focus on the negatives and um, between Mar Marlon and Mark's changing in particularly. And we were just total looking at it as a positive and we kept that messaging like well within our our camp Mar marlon mentioned we were fortunate with the bbc that they were able to um share video footage they used to have an extra camera just focusing on our, on our our kind of performances and our steve perks and graham knight with Mackie Sale with a, you know got that uh, footage and we would dissect it and look at what we can do differently so that was um you know a real um added value having that uh, capability but it was a yeah, it was just positive mindsets. Is that kind of technology moved on a lot in the last 17 years? Because back then, you, when you talk about borrowing BBC footage, I mean, I would guess these days, you know, the governing body would, would have a lot better, a lot better stuff themselves. Ask uh, Darren. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, now uh, we have uh, different individual cameras on the different athletes so that we don't necessarily need to rely on the footage that's, yeah. that's given out across the television. Um, so yeah, we, we're very specific and, and watch every single changeover. We have cameras obviously on every single changeover because it's changeovers that are the important parts. So the acceleration zone and, and all of those type of areas. Yeah. Now I am, um, I, I obviously had a rerun of the race this morning as well. I dipped onto YouTube and I had a quick look. A couple of things jumped out at me. First of all, I mean, I knew it was close, but I'd forgotten just how close, <laughs> <laughs> such a close race, so exciting. And then also the emotion afterwards, you know, you guys really, really kind of, you know, dancing and jigging around the track. I mean, it was uh, <laughs> really quite, quite an emotional, emotional few moments, isn't it? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Like from, from my perspective, just imagine being a young kid and dreaming of something and then actually achieving it on that level, you know, um, I remember watching Linford Christie race against Carl Lewis, Barcelona Olympics, and I've always said to myself, I want to, I want to, I want to know what that feels like. That's what, that's what I want to do, you know. And to achieve it in 2004 with my brothers, you know, um, it was one of the best, greatest feelings I've ever achieved in sport. Um, you know, especially again after having not achieved my individual targets, it, it, that there just made it all up for me, you know. Um, so yeah, 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 for me, it was amazing. That's why you see the explosion at the end of the race. It's just all the emotions, everything that's physically happened in the previous years, it's all coming out and going away. And 
getting an opportunity to actually put my hand on a, an Olympic gold medal. So, yeah. And you knew you'd won, right? Yeah, definitely. You know, uh, <laughs> it's mad because halfway down the track, I remember coming out of the zone and thinking, I'm in front here. And then going back in. And then <laughs> the determination, the grit, the focus was just on getting to the line and not messing up and not getting tight and making sure Morris Green doesn't pass me. You know, um, even though, um, who was the, the guy from Nigeria on uh, the last leg? Stacey Ali. They, I, oh, could yeah, hear yeah. Him, I could hear him, I could hear him somewhere. And I was thinking, just get to the line. And next thing I know, I crossed the line. I looked to my right and there's nobody there. And it's crazy. Absolutely crazy. I know I noticed That's a it. quote after the race where Maurice Green was quite was quite um, you know, sporting. But were, were the Americans pretty sporting or were they a bit hacked off? What, what, <laughs> were, there, were there any words, any words said after the race? For me, as a fellow athlete, you know, um, I didn't see none of that, you know. I really didn't. I probably was celebrating a little bit too much, but um, I think it was all right with with, yeah. with, with with us. I don't think there was... Obviously, you've just come second in a race. You're not going to be happy, you know. Oh. Certain athletes, it was their last ever Olympic champ, so you're going to be a little bit disappointed, but there was no malice towards us, you know, because yeah. at the end of the day, we, we put our best foot forward and we achieved what we needed to achieve, you know, uh, again, we was written off. People didn't even expect us to come forth. You know, um, we always knew a medal was in the pipeline, but we just didn't know which one it would have been. And uh, I'm just glad it happened with the guys that it happened with, because again, growing up as a, as the younger athlete, um, I've looked up to all three of these guys in my career and, you know, watched their videotapes, studied each and every one of them. You know, uh, I had the pleasure of training with nearly all of them, apart from, Jason, you know, but I used to watch Jason's starts religiously, you know, as a young athlete, you know, so they've all played a role in my life, you know, um, and to achieve my Olympic gold with these guys, um, you know, I couldn't ask for no more. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, the Americans were really graceful, to be honest with you. They, you know, yeah, I thought so too. Yeah, they, I think the year before, I wasn't in um, Paris World Championships, but you may, rem you may remember, your viewers may remember, they were really behaved badly on the podium. But I think that was Tim Montgomery and a group of them. There was a different, there was a different uh, bunch of American sprinters. Um, and I think they got in a lot of trouble with it. I suspect there was a lot of, you know, bad words between the US team and their, their team management because they were similar to where we were four years before. And, um, we know Darren was, Darren was like, I said, he's a B, he gets in everywhere, you know, gets the intel and everything. <laughs> um, he, he was, um, you know, so Darren would bring, yeah, Darren would bring back, uh, it, was, it was like, it's like stirring up a hornet's nest, but um, he would go in and find out what's going on the ground and stuff like that. And he knew about their team. They, they didn't want Kobe Miller in a team. Um, you know, they wanted somebody else in it. So we knew that Kobe Miller would felt that he, you know, didn't, he had to kind of like you know overprove to his uh, his place in the team, and we knew we had to try and be in the game, put pressure on Kobe because he was the only one out of their team which didn't have a medal from the individual events, and um, and that's what we did. We just put the pressure. That was our that was our plan. And, and uh, was that, is it Hannibal says you know love it when a plan comes together. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but it's uh, and and that's kind of what happened actually. So I think their management had a, and I think even the ramifications. I was watching a podcast the other week. Still to this day, when they look at the USA, how they constantly fail to deliver uh, in the relays. And I think someone I can't remember who it was talking about. It's quite simple. You should let the athletes, um, you know, have a bigger say in terms of the selections because they know what they're doing. I actually used Morris Screen at Atty Bolden's um, chat. It was oh yeah yeah. Uh, I saw uh, some of that. Yeah, on Instagram. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's just to say, sometimes, down, yeah, sometimes in management, um, and this is what happened in 2000, you know, try and overcomplicate it and then cause all the frictions. You know, you've got, you know, we're sp sprinters. Everyone knows that, you know, be highly strung, you know, that you know, alpha male kind of mentality and stuff. And then trying to play games with us, and it's your careers, you know, you, you've got to do that very, very carefully. Yeah. Mm. It's interesting as well, especially with the American teams, because they've got, seems like a conveyor belt of sprinters that can step up onto the track and deliver equal performances. So we definitely took advantage of the fact that all these teams can mix in so much. Granted, our GB team is quite a, a big, look at all their talent in the UK, 
uh, at the time. It could be many combinations, but the Americans, because they have so many more, uh, we definitely use that as an advantage. And Kobe, as, as, as Jason said, as Kobe was definitely the weakness, albeit at a very, very high, high mark. Right? <laughs> uh, and yeah. if you look back on the outside looking in, back yeah. then you think, we were so brave, but our confidence and we believed in each other. It was uh, these, these, these three guys, man. Yeah. I think, um, you know, when you get a bit older, you have a bit more wisdom, you see what... And I think the term's called um, psychological safety. So you're, you're free to have that conversation with someone. I'm not, I'm not marking your character. It's just, um, this is what we need to do. I'm not yeah. knocking you as a person. I'm not knocking you as who you are. It's about, this is what we need to do. I'm going to speak to you quite brash and straight, straightforward with it and still get the job done. And I weren't offended and the rest of the boy, and it takes a certain type of... Um, uh, character and understanding. I didn't. I didn't know it at the time. It's only now I look back and I try and think. Why did we? Why were we so connected? Why did we connect so well? And uh, ah, this makes sense. Psychological psychological safety. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Um, yeah, looking back and we we could be completely raw to get the best performance out of us. And it's something that uh, yeah, uh, very proud and yeah, just going through this uh, experience now is just it sweets me every time. <laughs> you say it was the uh you know it all came together perfectly but I, no I noticed a quote from Steve Perks after the race he said there's still room for improvement there's one or two things that, that were not <laughs> not right <laughs> Steve Perks is that is that, yeah. is that right was the were the things that weren't quite perfect that you can remember or was it was it just about I think that's perfect? just the nature of a sprinters I think that's a sprinters thing I think as well we all uh, I guess Always when you yeah, we're always trying to find. Um, the extra uh, there's no, there's no, there, yeah, there's no destination to it, is there? We're always trying yeah. to find a little, a bit here and a move there. So, uh, definitely, uh, I can see why he said that. And also, keep us on the ball for future years, right? So you don't want to get complacent. He's yeah. seen it before in the past, so he's keep us on the ball. There's probably, again, I would not have realised that being a young whippersnapper running around the track back then. But as you get older, you're starting to see how the coaching it goes beyond just the moment. I think Steve was probably thinking about, yeah, there's still room for improvement. Keep these boys on the sharp and narrow for future success. Although we never raced again. Yeah, I was going to say, is that right? You guys never yeah. raced again as a quartet after no, that? No, no. Yeah. I was thinking of the brand. The brand. Well, we did once. <laughs> we did once for charity. Oh, yeah, in Manchester. Remember, old. Yeah. yeah. I'm seeing the <laughs> yeah. just a lot shorter. We rolled back the years and, and we, we ran one more time. <laughs> and we still won. <laughs> Yes. When, when was that roughly? Um, after the oh. Manchester bombing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Did you did you guys break sixty seconds? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Come on, you gotta give us a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. I mean, but for, but be going back to a more serious note. I mean, for, for me, um, Jason, to all the viewers listening. You know, opportunity can bring us, present itself in adversity. And 2000, 2003 was the kind of bombshell which rocked British sport, British sprinting, um, with the whole Balco situation. And then the realisation with one of our teammates had been banned and all of the performances from 2003, the guys lost their medals. I wasn't even part of the squad. I had a falling out. I wasn't, you know, I hadn't had been part of the relay for two years. And then um, the realisation there's no automatic qualification. And what that done, that enforced actually um, some real clarity of purpose and you know, what we want to achieve. And I remember when we were all in that room and those which stayed agreed that if we're going to put, um, put some performance to get together to try and qualify for the team, it required putting that above our own individual performances because a lot of us trained in different places and you know, in yeah. different parts of the world. And then we made this kind of um, yeah a, a, a kind of code of conduct, you know, create our own values that we were going to you know work for each other and give commitment. We weren't going to do some of the things which were used to happen, like people would say they come training camps, and then you find out they've gone to Zurich to earn money on the Grand Prix, or they're just playing silly buggers, just messing around, being late, or not quite fully focusing on on the um, the task in hand with like training. So that was for me was amazing because a group of people um, that was you know part of that gave absolutely hundred percent, 
And that's how we kind of really came together as a team and we had each other's backs. And I think a bit of maturity as well for us. And Mark was still very young, but for some of uh, Marlon, um, Darren and myself, you know, four years before when we're trying to kind of like hustle to see, you know, who's be the top dog, one minute it's um, Christian or Darren or Dwayne or myself. We were just kind of fighting against each other, you know, trying to be the man. Um, but we had much more respect, and I guess because we gone through we're a lot older but we'd also had more experience of picking up medals in uh, different events and what have you and that that kind of that bond between us became stronger and which is to this day is probably one of the most you know uh, best best uh, outcomes for me uh, being involved in athletics that I've got these used, used to be my rivals and now we're like the best of friends because we've just been connected by that wonderful experience and that's what sport can do and athletics can be a great sport when it's um it's delivered right. I think your story is very similar to the, the four by four guys who I spoke to a few weeks ago, John Regis, Chris Akabusi, Derek Redmond, Roger Black, in that they had their own individual rivalries. You know, they're up against each other a lot in the same event, but ultimately they all came together and they all kind of saw the common cause and they're, they're still really good mates to this day, you know, years on. And I can see lots of similarities with, with you guys as, as well. Yeah, it is, a, it is a strange dynamic, isn't it? When you think about the four of us uh, arrivals, myself and Dan, I'd say more so over the 200 metres. And <laughs> try, I can't, Marlon, don't look up to Darren, man. You've got to compete against him. Come on, <laughs> fix up. Come on. And try and, <laughs> and, um, and try and get my mindset in the right, get the mind in the right place and uh, moving down to the 100, I'd say, uh, from my perspective, trying to keep compete with Mark and Jason. Come on, even from Jason from way back back and forth trying to beat and trying to compete against them and then together you know this is quite easy to have quite some animosity because it's, it's almost expected you're supposed to have that animosity towards somebody because you're trying to beat them right but again it comes down to the character of being able to switch it off okay we have to work together you know my weaknesses i know yours let's be completely vulnerable let's put let's put it down on the track and work together and um with these three guys it's it, it came easy the more time we spent together, the more medals we won individually. It's almost a case of um, you think of a team as like a rugby team or a football team. You kind of go away, try and enhance your skills for the team to bring it back into the, the squad, right? So it seemed like our medals and uh, all our successes, times winning quicker, were us moving away, doing our individual performances to then come bring all, that, all those skills into the team and then have the mental capacity to be able to... Uh, switch off our egos and uh, stand on the track and give it our best. Why didn't you guys race again? Was it just due to injuries and stuff? I mean, I mean, it's quite, it's quite cool in a way, I think, that you just kind of win the Olympic gold and it's almost like dropping the mic. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but it, that it is a new just, saying. It also seems bizarre that you never, you never got together, apart from the, apart from the Manchester uh, race years, years later, as, as Darren mentioned. I think I think we was all at um, different parts in our careers. You know, uh, I was obviously the youngest in the team, so I carried on competing and trying to achieve my own personal goals. You know, um, individually. Um, I think was it the following year Darren retired? I retired two thousand and six. So two thousand and five, I was injured. Mm. I was injured the whole season. Mm. Um, so yeah, then two thousand and six was my last. Uh, season as an athlete so I did go to the European champs I think we won gold there um, in the four by one but that was my last champs yeah that was with uh, yeah Mark Mark and Marlon yeah yes that, yes, yeah. yes 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 so we was still competing but yeah you know I think after the Olympics we kind of knew in the back of our minds that we probably wouldn't go to another Olympics because there was a lot of young talent coming through you know you had Timmy Williamson Adam Jamili, you know, um, Ricky Fifton. There was a whole bunch of young talents that were coming through. So for me, it was like, I need to try and stay in some kind of shape so I can compete with these guys. So I kind of focused more on my individual. Uh, I'm not saying I wasn't focused on the relays, but, you know, I knew it was coming to the end of my day. So I tried to um, move, well, move coach, um, and try to better myself individually. So, um, yeah, I think the job was done in 2004, you know, um, and there's no real reason for us to race again because we had nothing to prove to anyone, you know. 
I mean, you, you've obviously obviously got the medals somewhere. Have you have you kept those uh, those slinky speed suits that you wore during ah. the final? And, 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 slinky. And, <laughs> slinky. Try and on the other day. Hey, and can you right, still get into them? <laughs> <laughs> oh. My, you might, you might think, hear me squeaking a bit. Yeah, I think my calf, <laughs> I think my calf can fit in. <laughs> not a joke. It's not a joke. Yeah. yeah. I, I think do- I can fit in mine. I think I can fit in mine. It'd be a tight, yeah. tight squeeze. You know, you, you know, you can, don't you, Marlon? You probably yeah, you've done that. You've done that recently, haven't you? Yeah, he's tried it on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, I, 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 I was sleeping it last night just to, just to <laughs> get my mind in the right kind of mindset for tonight. <laughs> And mine belongs in a frame now. <laughs> and, Brilliant. And uh, and how did those games rank generally against other other championships? Because I mean, you guys must have done so many championships between you. I mean, I, you must have done literally dozens between you. I mean, how how did Athens? How did Athens uh, compare to everything else? My my enduring memory is it is of it just being extraordinarily hot. Yes. Yeah. But for me, yeah. I don't think I've ever experienced a, a game, the championships like Athens ever again. I think the whole build up, the whole atmosphere, the whole everything was just a different experience. I think we went there willing to go there and do the job. I think I could feel the failure of 2000 being put right in Athens, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Even though I wasn't in Sydney, I knew there was a lot of things that was being amended. You know, um, I think the, the the way our heavy athlete was disciplined, you know, because um, normally you get to a game, you're like, wow, I'm here. And then you kind of forget about the job in hand. I don't think nobody forgot about the job in hand, even though we didn't go out there and achieve, you know, individuals. I think a lot of us put a lot of pressure on ourselves. You know, I can speak personally for myself, put a whole bunch of pressure on myself, stumbled at the blocks and messed up big time, but was given a second chance in a four by one. And um, I just felt it was very professional. And I don't think I've ever experienced anything like that again afterwards in my career. That's why, you know, I just couldn't really get to where I needed to be because the level where we left Athens was really high. So, so yeah. I think I think the lows and the highs, I'd never experienced um, them on that scale at any other championships. Um, normally, the championships felt a lot like that. Yeah, with gradual progression, you know, uh, winning individual medals, winning relay medals, they felt kind of normal and stable and on a good trajectory. But um, Athens, I just think so much was going on. There was so much going on off the track. It was hard at times to focus on what you're supposed to be doing on it. Um, and I think that was one of the most difficult things. And I think that's that's what drew us together as a squad because we all had different things going on that were negative. Yeah. <laughs> and then we had to come together and almost put all that negativity aside and think on a totally different positive level. As I say, we we had no doubt we would win. And that sounds crazy. How can you have no doubt you're going to win? The competition's not even happened yet and you've got no doubt that you're going to win. And you're coming from a place where you should have a tremendous amount of doubt because yeah. everything's been going wrong. <laughs> but, but I remember it being, a, a lot of people maybe interpret it as cocky um, ambition or, or, or being um, really confident. confident. But we were humbly confident, if that makes any sense. Very yeah. humble in everything. Even when we turned up for relay practice, everything was no mess. We used to do our own warm up and then come together and Everything was on board. You know, um, there was no messing about that I can remember. In the, no, in, the call, in the call room before the race, you were all fairly quiet, weren't you? Whereas the Americans were quite quite loud in comparison. It was, it was unbelievable. Yeah. It, was like we was, it was like we was just all... It was like we was reading each other's minds. Yeah, like we're it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. I thought, Darren, you know how it was? You sit on the bench, you put your bag next to you. And I thought, Darren tapped me and he went... You're gonna be all right, you know, kid. And I was like, bloody hell, how did you know? <laughs> you know, um, how did you know I was, you know, doubting myself that one percent, you know, but thanks for that. I needed that. Let's go. You know, um, you know, the Americans, let's go, huh, huh, let's go. And we're just there like this. Yeah, so true. 
That was Woo! Awesome. Come on, man. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm, I'm there tightening my spikes, you know, making sure not one pin falls out, you know. Um, I'm just doing my own mental preparation. I'm, I'm looking at these shoes that I've just got and I'm thinking, we're going to do this. You know, um, you know, just like humbly confident. And I think, you know, to be in that space, everything that's happened previous all comes together. That's why I always go out there and I say to like, even my kids, you know, misses, whatever. It may be hard in the moment, but when you get to the moment, it feels so much easier, you know, because you've done all the prep. You know, um, and I think that's what it was for us. We prepped, we was prepped. You know, um, I think we went over there. We, we went out onto the track, empty-minded. You know, we knew what we needed to do, especially after the semi-final. You know, we was worrying about pigeon steps. Is my hand flat enough? You know, um, you know, I'm gonna go too early. And then, you know, we left that all on the warm-up track. So, you know, when we went out, it was just a sweet, sweet feeling. You know, like Jason said, if you could bottle that up and sell it. We'd be all millionaires. We really would, you know. Um, so yeah. Another thing I noticed watching the video earlier was was the first changeover with Jason to Darren, where you literally went boom with a baton. It was like so decisive, and it you know almost kind of just just showed that you meant business. Yeah. The um, I mean that's what they say, isn't it? When you when you're speaking to kids, you know, practice makes perfect, and teamwork makes the dream work. Yeah. That's it. That's it. That, they were the masterclasses, Darren and myself. Um, so basically, um, with the with with the kind of relay orders, you know, that was my home first leg from World Juniors when we put me, who was the fastest at the time, on the first leg. I didn't realise back then why we'd done that. You traditionally put the fast person on the last leg, but I think the management had, you know, followed what the, the boys had done in in 1991 when Roger went first. Um, and then over the years, I got to work so much with Darren and Marlon. So those two athletes, I could tell you exactly their characteristics and where they're going to be, where Mar Marlon's hand will be compared to, compared to, to Darren's. And it was just years of knowing each other. It, you, you, you know, I felt that confident that we could run it and I could close my eyes and, and make those changes with him. It was just everything was, just, was in sync. Um, and that was what it was all for. It all built down, you know, to that moment in time. That's what everything was all for. It was for the yeah. Olympic final, and that was it. Delivering on maximum. Yeah, definite, definite. There was a maximum amount of trust um, that I had in Jason. There was no need for me to look back. There was no need for me to doubt that he would catch me. Um, all I had to do was just put my hand back and put it in the right place. Yeah. And I knew he'd find me as quickly as possible. Again, going into the final, we knew we we knew the Americans had to make a mistake for us to be able to be victorious. And the only way we were going to achieve that is by having, I would call it perfect changeovers. Um, Steve Perks wouldn't. No, no. That's <laughs> why I, I would disagree with Steve because <laughs> apart from the flat speed, for me, when you're talking about perfect changeovers, that's that's as close as it gets to perfect yeah. changeovers. Um, as I ran into Marlon a little bit, like Jason just said there, where he felt like he could pass the baton with his eyes closed, I had actually attempted that a couple of times in some of the drills that we've done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to Marlon. We definitely think, talked I don't about Marlon it. Looks back at all. I don't think Marlon looks back at all either. It's on the video. I think it's a little hard to tell because it's obscured with other athletes and stuff. But I think you know, no, he doesn't I mean, look back. Definite, definite not. Again, see, that's, I, I knew yeah. where Marlon's hand would be, and as soon as I shouted hand, I just wanted to give him that baton as quickly as possible. And that's where I could <laughs> see then, out the corner of my eye, the little mistake happening with the Americans, mm. a little bit yeah. of a fumble, and then Marlon just ran a magnificent third leg and. Yeah, handed the the baton on to uh, Mark with a lead. See, there's, there's, you've got to, yeah, you've got to look at the, the trust. So uh, we've all been in teams where we've turned to an athlete and gone, "You're all right, mate. You're all right," and they've gone, "Yeah, yeah, 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 yeah." And you think You're something not right. he's not telling me, <laughs> something he's not telling me, man. And you go, I, I, "I'll let it slide, let it slide." And then, and then you on your marks, you you're passing the baton on to me. I could probably bring it in one pigeon step or take it out because you didn't have that conversation. You didn't, mm. 
is that, that moment of doubt. And that doubt is a split of a second. We live in a world of a splits of a second. We can't have no doubt. So when Darren's running, his, running to me, I don't need to look back. There's no doubt. I know Darren's going to give me the bat, and it's up to me to make sure I execute. So um, going back to the race and thinking of the race and that, Marlon, you just execute your part of the race. You're all good. The boys, you're done. I don't need to worry about the boys. Mm -hmm. So even when Jason did his false start, remember, we haven't even spoke about that. When Jason's false start, it's all right. Whatever it is, he's, he's cool. He's not going to do another one. I knew implicitly without any question that Jason was not going to do a second false start. He's got yeah. a plan. He'll do his thing. I do not need to wait. Whatever's happened, he's now cleared it out of his head. He's all good. And, and then when, when he down, yeah, yeah, it was all good. Uh, and then when, it, when what, I just going to go, I don't need to look back. When I put my hand, that baton's going to be in my hand. And uh, <laughs> it's quite interesting. When you watch it on, t on TV from afar and the baton goes into the hand, it looks like it's just gently placed into your hand. Uh, but it actually feels like it's been slapped into your hand at pace and it gives you this, this, <gasps> it's my turn. Come on, let's go. And you just let rip. And, and as, as Darren said, it was, um, I look at my journey as a complete frustration going through that year because I've been injured, um, getting too big and bulky, trying to get away from the injuries, then uh, not losing my finesse in my running, my, my technique, and then uh, doing a whole heap of training with Steve Perks uh, uh, leading the way with it and realizing and he's just trimmed down it's, it's all there it's all still there and then realizing that just before literally semi-final and going out there and yeah it's a, a, again as as we've all said we've all had our journeys are, are all, all have our own battles and how to stay on that positive task that positive side and uh yeah going back to the race just making sure i've got no doubt that downs and giving that baton i don't need to, so i can go all guns blazing 100%, 101%, just go for it and know that the baton's going to be there. And that's, and if I didn't, and if we didn't, without question, a silver medal, possibly a bronze. So uh, we, we won by split, one, it's the smallest margin in athletics. So um, it was imperative that we uh, were able to have that complete, complete trust. Uh, and it was uh, definitely something that, I think that's also, we look back and, I know that these boys, that trust was there. And it's something you can imagine. Can you think, those listeners out there, can you think of someone you can implicit trust to the ninth degree? Do you, can you? Is there anybody? And then have four people to do that in a sport all through different journeys. It's something that was unique. And we all built that together. I think that's why we, had, we were so confident when we competed. Yeah, nice. All came together. A slightly, mm. um, a slightly random note, but... You were, you were on the same night as, as one of Kelly one of Kelly Holmes' wins as well, weren't you? Yeah, we were. And um, the interesting thing is, so we were in the um, final call room at um, this point. So we'd gone through like a, was that, nearly two hours of um, first call right the way through. And as was mentioned earlier on, where you know, the Americans and the other teams were like, you know, trying to psych each other out. We were, you know, trying to, you know, be a threat to America. And then suddenly you got the Italians or, like, or some of the other kind of teams which were... Um, trying to like psych us out and these teams we would be like day in day out so um but we're in line formation and we were just about to go out into the lion's den and we hear the national anthem that you played and that was like the realization that kelly Holmes had won another gold medal and i i, I vividly remember because i'm in the, all the lane lane one or leg one runners next to me darren and then i looked darren's eyes the look was just, this is our time. It was just like, and, uh, and then I looked at Marlon and then um, Mark, the look was absolutely, you know, it would sit in their eyes. This is our time. Yeah. There was just too many things going that evening or in the build up to it, which were just real positives, the changeovers, the feelings that we, that we we'd had. And then, um, we went out into the uh, yeah the lions den and went first first time we spill up as a as a as a quartet. But hearing the national anthem being played out loud, and as you'll know, Jason, we don't well the last Olympics we don't we didn't hear it once. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't get played that much, but that lifted our spirits. And I think that's the thing about sport. It's like when even when you're in a squad or team, and somebody goes out and gets a medal earlier on, it just lifts the morale of the team. 
and just yeah. in whereas when you go in this into a kind of competition and know and your best athletes aren't delivering or having a bad time you just suddenly feel that kind of nervous energy you know permeate throughout the team from the management down or seeing athletes coming back looking dejected but that helped us massively yeah definitely definitely it was all in uniform ready to go out and run and the national anthem comes on that's definitely definitely will raise your spirit you know um because i didn't know at first cause i didn't know the schedule who was competing and i was like someone's just won a medal yeah. then kelly holmes you know um and that definitely spurred us on, you know. Uh, Must have added to the whole atmosphere in the, in oh, the arena the crowd, as well on the night. The crowd went absolutely crazy, you know. Um, it just That night in Athens, it felt like there was a lot of British support in there. there was, was, um, and it was magical. It, it, I've never experienced anything like it. Even in 2002 in Manchester, you know, I didn't experience that. That was, yeah. you know, for me... My, my feet were already running and I was walking to the, to the start line, you know, I was ready to go. You know, um, I really was like, you know, when you've got a race car and it's firing on all cylinders, perfectly tuned. We was all perfectly tuned, ready to go. I don't think it would have took a lot for us to fail on that night, you know. Yeah. Um, I'd just, I just, like, I just like to add, actually, I mean, no, for, for me, I'm oblivious to the kind of crowd when you're going there because you're so focused in the zone. It was only afterwards when the you know the celebrations where you've seen all the union flags and there's so much support which which was which was wonderful but going to the Mayan start blocks and you know doing your due diligence just because you're an Olympic game don't assume you know the equipment is um how it's meant to be Mark talked about checking doing the spikes and stuff like that um when you check those blocks and you feel so weak you're so nervous you know, how about I suppose one of the fastest men in the world I feel really weak um, and then um, I, the baton was a gold-coloured baton. It was just again another sign that you know this is this is just positivity, and I'm and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fight it. You know, although I was really kind of bit, I, I spent a bit too much time trying not to look at the other athletes and be gutted to see if they all had gold-coloured batons. But then I you know I looked at the Nigerians. It was a more of a bronze-coloured looking baton, and which they finished in third place. And then uh, the Americans, you know, had a totally different colour baton, so I didn't know more convincing, but. It was just um, it was just a, a night of positive energy yeah. throughout us. And even Jason, even the, um, our, our relay um, reserves, because we've, we've spoken a lot about our own experiences or the quartet, but they played their part as well. You know, there was um, f four other athletes which, you know, were so close to being part of the team in terms of the starting four, but weren't. But without them playing their part, we would not have been able to achieve the success we did because we all knew our places and positions and they helped make that happen. You know, they came to practice, they did their best performances. And if I was to get injured, we knew who would come in to replace me and, and likewise for everybody else. But that was a difference between four years before when every, it was just mm. every, every man for themselves. I think you give them give them good credit in the book as well because, it. I mean, I've got you four guys on the call here, but, you know, it was a... There was a wider squad. Yeah, there were there were coaches involved as well, and I think they do get good credit in the book, which is which is nice. Yeah. Well, one one last question from me. You laughed a moment ago when I said, "Did you break sixty seconds?" If you if you had to get together now for a comeback, hey, hey. Ooh, be catching a bus. Would you, would you get <laughs> would you get around the track without the hamstrings popping, or what would you? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm not going to lie, the other day, I went for a little run and I'm not going to lie, my, amst my hamstrings have shrunken. The pain I was in afterwards was unreal. You know, my little girl says, Dad, you sure you used to sprint? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, yeah, like being a sprinter right now, it definitely, um, I'd be more four by one jogger. That's what it would be. I don't think I'd be able to get around 200 metres, let alone anything else. So, yeah. yeah. You, you guys all look in uh, decent shape, though. Seriously, you look like you're in, you're in not bad shape. No, i tell you what would happen. If we all had a race, a 100 metre race, it'd be like fireworks, and there'd be our hamstrings popping in the background. <laughs> boom. There goes Darren. Boom. There goes Marlon's hamstring. Jason will get boom. There'll be loads of fireworks. There'll be our hamstrings popping in the background. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, a And we'd all hobble off the track. 
<laughs> yeah, uh, no, I, I'd have to rule myself out yeah. due to health reasons. <laughs> yeah. It's mad and it is crazy. Yeah, I dream. My mind tells me I can do it, but the body definitely yeah. is different. You know? There's um there's one guy who um who we, you mentioned earlier on obviously who's kept himself in really good shape Dwayne ah yes he's really yes. I mean he was he was still running really well into his early forties wasn't he yeah yeah, yeah. I, I don't think he's retired yet no no probably not no no <laughs> I not. think he's still going no. No. see him in the trials man yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Mar- Marlon were being really good yeah. shape. Like I, I put no, no, in okay. Marlo being in good shape. Okay, I'll be honest. I'll be honest with you. So, um, obviously, we're, I'm out in Shanghai at the moment. I work out at British International School in Shanghai, and uh, my ECA program, my extra uh, activity, involves the kids obviously doing sprints, endurance, throws, and, and I'm heavily involved in that. And uh, to keep the kids motivated, so uh, I'm talking year six, seven, and eight. <laughs> You still race them, like, don't you? Yeah, I, still, yeah. I, I, I go right. I stand them. I, I give them about three meters. I go right. Okay, you ready? Mr. Devonish is gonna come past you. If he comes past you, he's still got it. Two, <laughs> one. Ah! So it keeps them motivated. So at the end of the session, so I do keep in contact. I do keep in shape, but nowhere near. I wouldn't even try to uh, go flat out because I'd, I'd expect something to pop. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they're, they're all kids that are kind of 10, 11 years old. Yeah, right up to 18, so I wouldn't probably race against them. If they're listening to this now, they'll probably be challenging me tomorrow. But uh, yeah, yeah, so uh, I've been very blessed to share uh, everything we're talking about, uh, my career, and share it with uh, from year four at the moment right through to uh, uh, year 13 in different capacities. So it's really, really, really lucky and privileged to uh, be able to share my knowledge and uh, loving it.